In this episode of Quakers Today, we ask, how do you process memories, experiences, and feelings? In today's episode, you will learn about a new book that raises questions about the future of Quakerism. Lauren Brownlee considers how Quaker testimonies can combat white supremacy. Nathan Kleban tells us about the personal journey that led him to intentional communities around the United States as a young man. He now applies the lessons he learned as he works to confront economic injustice. And you will meet my new co-host. I am Peterson Toscano. This is Season 3, Episode 1 of the Quakers Today podcast, a project of Friends Publishing Corporation. This season of Quakers Today is sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee. This season, you will hear an additional regular voice on the Quakers Today podcast, Mish McCall. Mish, a professional friend, advocates living in harmony with spirit and joy. Their journey into Quakerism began after Oberlin College. Mish is actively involved with Quaker Earth Care Witness and Brooklyn Friends Meeting. Hello, Mish, and welcome to Quakers Today. Hi, Peterson. It's great to be here. I'm just so thrilled to have a colleague to work with on this podcast. Podcasting can be a lonely sport. And you're someone who loves audio, it sounds like, the sort of mm-hmm. playfulness that you have at projects that you've done in the past. I've worked on friends and classmates podcasts, but most of my stuff, I really have done a lot of soundscapes just for classwork. This is the first time someone has paid me to do it. Not only are you a Quaker or a friend, but you're a professional friend. It's like friend for pay? Like, how how does this work? (laughs) Yeah. I learned about the term released friend a few months ago. I tried desperately to figure out what it means to be released. What are you released from? The answer for released friends who are ministers are people who are released from capitalism. They are paid by their congregation or their meeting in order to focus solely on faith work. While I'm not paid to be a minister, being a professional friend means I get to spend all of my time thinking and worshiping and learning more about this faith. Quaker Earth Care Witness is an important part of that work for you. I'm the communications and outreach coordinator at QEW. Only two of us are on staff. We have a general secretary, but we do have a 50-person board. So it's a really big community, and I get to put on events and worship sharing, get to think about climate change from a truly holistic place. And you came to Quakerism after college. Yeah. I'm a Quaker because Quakerism reached me at a really particular place in my life. I'm sure there's at least one person listening who can relate to that. And a listener, you will hear more from Mish later on the show when we're going to check in after you hear all of the audio we've prepared for you today. Thank you, Mish. I look forward to chatting with you in a little while. Yeah, see you soon and excited to talk to you and our listeners. I recently spoke with Nathan Kleban. I asked Nathan about his spiritual journey and about economic justice. He also agreed to read excerpts from his article, Move Toward the Suffering, Confronting Injustice Head On. A transformative moment for me was living in community. That sense of community was very transformative for me, both in learning more about myself and then in seeing what we can do together. I I just kind of saw myself becoming a lot more alive in those contexts. And I saw that in others as well. That aliveness uh, is a very powerful thing. It helps us to do things. And so that was a big shift for me. I go between worlds in a lot of ways. If I'm in a Quaker space, people might think of me as like, oh, he's kind of that Buddhist oriented guy. Or if I'm in a Buddhist setting, it's like, oh, he's that Quaker guy. I don't really carry conscious definition so much, but it's interesting to think about how others define me as different depending on the setting. Recently, I returned to visit the Salinas Valley, the salad bowl of the world in California's Central Coast, where I had lived prior to the pandemic. As I drove past its fields, the precise symmetry of crop rows grabbed my eyes like an optical illusion. 
the straight rows converged on the hills that rose in the distance. Periodically, people and trucks filled the empty geometric spaces, shattering the illusion. Farm workers hunched over while gathering strawberries. Then, with their boxes full, they ran at full speed under the heat of the midday sun to deliver the goods that would eventually make their way to supermarkets around the world. Thus, they fulfilled their roles in the global supply chain. Years ago, I began to wonder how I could be in right relationship with these workers. And I wondered the same thing about the people I was on my way to meet. We're all complicated and we all have stuff. And when we're close with other people, our edges grind up against each other. I'm kind of grinding my knuckles together a little bit here. There can be stuff to work through, especially when it's easier and easier to just escape through digital devices or just going off and and kind of having our own kind of space. Being with others in much more intimate ways, it takes work emotionally and with communication and so forth, especially for those who grew up and they had their own bedroom growing up. And then they, of course, you can still do that in community, but having their own kind of sense of space and how much space they need that can rub up against our sense of what's normal and comfortable. And so there is discomfort to work with. Individualism has definitely been pushed up or held very highly. In some ways, that can be a healthy thing. We need to take care of ourselves and make sure we're safe. And in other ways, we become blind to others when we hold that too rigidly. There's a quote that comes to mind. I forget who said it. They said, don't be an individual. I think of that, whether it shows up in like Buddhist teachings with interbeing, understanding that we're not this separate, discrete individual that just shows up unaffected by others. Tens of millions of people are living enslaved lives shrouded behind global supply chains. Slavery helps produce our clothing, our food, our technological devices. And then there are the myriad forms of exploitation that are a regular occurrence. There's walking by the unhoused person on the sidewalk and driving by the people picking strawberries. If I were in a history class in the future, how might I fantasize that I acted now? Understanding how these relationships came to be is central to learning how to end them and to establish new kinds of relationships. I don't write this in judgment of others or myself, but to ask, What are the kinds of communities we need in order to best live out our aspirations? How can we accommodate individuals and communities to live in ways that aren't accommodating to the status quo? These quote-unquote economic concerns can often be not seen as spiritual or religious in significance. An example would be children in Congo mining cobalt for smartphones that we use. That might not come up in traditional religious spaces, but it's something that I appreciate that it does in my Quaker meeting that I'm a part of. Likewise, ethnic cleansing and genocide in Gaza. That's an active conversation that we have with Iowa City friends. I appreciate that sense of engaging with these things as a community, connecting those to our lives, not as some disconnected matter that's not really relevant, but seeing how it is connected and seeing how we can engage with it. The earth is a part of the world too. Earth is kind of the economy as a way of looking at who's doing the work and who's getting their needs met. The Earth is doing a lot of work. (laughs) It's doing most of the work. Its needs aren't really being met. We don't have like tree or river labor unions yet or anything like that. And so they're not really able to advocate for themselves. And so they just get mined and destroyed. When it comes to suffering, I think of the Catholic worker, which I've been involved with for a number of years, and they have this approach they call personalism. It's about building relationship with people, meeting people where they're at, getting to know them, yeah, being in relationship. Out of that, that's where the action and the effort and the work kind of flows from. You form the relationship and then things arise out of that relationship, out of that knowing someone else. You're being a part of that relationship as well what role you play on a personal dimension, that kind of personalism is very important. As Buddhists might say, we we live in an ocean of suffering. How do we sit with that and, and move with it?
That was Nathan Cleveland speaking about and reading from his article, Move Toward the Suffering, Confronting Injustice Head On. It is available online at friendsjournal.org. Nathan facilitates alternatives to violence project workshops and works for the right sharing of world resources. He also enjoys playing games. One of his favorites is a complex cooperative board game called Spirit Island. Quakers are uniquely called from our principles and practices to lean into racial equity principles, to engage in the antidote to white supremacy culture. I am Lauren Brownlee, she, her pronouns from Washington, D.C. I am a member at Bethesda Friends Meeting in Baltimore Yearly Meeting. I have been very interested in Tema Okun's work on white supremacy culture and some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture that include aspects like perfectionism, either or kind of binary thinking, one right answer, individualism, urgency. Many of the Quaker testimonies give guidance for how we might engage in racial equity work. When I think about the peace testimony, I think about our being open to a range of ways that people engage, a range of beliefs that people might have, a range of worldviews and backgrounds, and how we are in community, which is another of the testimonies, together. Our peace testimony invites us into an openness. Our community testimony invites us to think about who all is in our community, How do we have expanding, overlapping concentric circles of community? And how are we caring uniquely for each member of our community? How are we answering to that of God in them, even if it looks different from that of God within us, which it will, because we are all unique. Then it takes community. It takes listening to everyone in that community to be our best selves, to build that beloved community that I believe we are striving for, that truly is with equity and justice for all. We have to hold up those different worldviews, those different perspectives as being just as important, as being just as essential in beloved community building as our own Even when that feels uncomfortable for us, that that sense of discomfort is often our growing and leaning into that growth, leaning into something that is unfamiliar, that helps us to be stronger as a community. And then finally, stewardship is also an invitation for us to be thoughtful about how we are building relationships across our communities. It is important for us to hold on to the fact that white supremacy culture is ever present in Quaker communities and our antidotes are right there present alongside these aspects of white supremacy culture that we encounter. That was an excerpt from the Quaker Speak video entitled How Quaker Testimonies Can Combat White Supremacy. It features Lauren Brownlee, the Associate General Secretary for Community and Culture at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, or FCNL. You will find this Quaker Speak video and others at the Quaker Speak channel on YouTube or visit quakerspeak.com. I keep saying, until I work through the stack I already have beside my bed, I can't possibly buy any more books. But then I read the book review section in Friends Journal, and suddenly, I need another one. For the March 2024 issue of Friends Journal, Lauren Brownlee, who you just heard, reviewed A Quaker Ecology, Meditations on the Future of Friends. Cherise Bach wrote the book. Let me tell you a little bit about it. A Quaker Ecology expands on content Bach shared during the Bible Half Hour series at the 2020 New England Yearly Meetings Annual Sessions. Cherise Bach opens our eyes to the deep connections between our spiritual practices and the ecological crisis of our times. She questions whether our traditional Quaker ways are still relevant or are too caught up in outdated ideologies. 
The idea of eco-reformation Bach presents is not just an expansion of our vision, but an invitation to a new way of engaging with our world, connecting deeply with the light that binds all life. In the book, Bach writes about watershed discipleship. This includes acknowledging the ecological crisis we're in, finding our place in our local environment, and extending our care to the creatures and features of our landscapes. Bach also considers a Quaker eco-theology of light. The book may serve as a roadmap for anyone interested in exploring how faith intersects with environmental stewardship. It's about envisioning a future where we, as Quakers and fellow inhabitants of this planet, move beyond past limitations towards a holistic community of all life. So yes, I need this book, and maybe you do too. The book is a Quaker ecology, Meditations on the Future of Friends. It's written by Sharice Bach. Lauren Brownlee's review is in the March 2024 issue of Friends Journal, or you can find it online at friendsjournal.org. Well, we've come to the end of our episode, and Mish, are you still here with us? I am, Peterson. How are you feeling, and what's your takeaway from today's episode? I feel great. I learned so much from Nathan and Lauren. I really like that they invite us to lean into suffering. I have a personal connection. My mother is from Salinas, where Nathan was doing his work with migrant workers. I did feel this disconnect between my mother's family, who were white and somewhat conservative and middle class, and the migrant workers that surrounded them. And it hit me how separate we all feel from the people who are so vital to the things we eat and the ways that we live. And Lauren talked about how the light of God might look different in different people. And that's that's something I hadn't thought about, where God is different to everyone. People who may seem so outside of my beloved community have that same light of God. Yeah, and for someone listening who doesn't really believe in God, you can use your own language because that's that's the cool thing about Quakers and Quakerism is we don't share a single belief in God. For some people, you're non-theist. So that light within you may not be God at all, but you describe it in some other way. And I love that about Quakerism. Everyone's welcome. I love that too. I guess except if you're like violent and a bigot. I guess you're not really welcome there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mies, thanks for being here. And you want to wrap it up with me today? Sounds good. All right. And thank you, listener, for joining us for this episode of Quakers Today. If you like what you heard today and listen to Apple Podcasts, please rate and review our show. Many thanks to everyone who has shared Quakers Today with their friends and on social media. Quakers Today is written and produced by Peterson Toscano. Uh-uh, and now also by you too, <laughs> Mish. <laughs> Music on today's show comes from Epidemic Sound. Season three of Quakers Today is sponsored by American Friends Service Committee. Do you want to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting peace? The American Friends Service Committee, or AFSC, works with communities worldwide to drive social change. Their website features meaningful steps you can take to make a difference. Through their Friends Liaison Program, you can connect your meeting or church with AFSC and their justice campaigns. Find out how you can become part of AFSC's global community of changemakers. Visit AFSC.org. That's AFSC.org. Visit quakerstoday.org to see our show notes and a full transcript of this episode. Thank you, friend. We look forward to spending more time with you soon. Let me share next month's question with you. What recommendation do you have for us? 
In each episode, we share reviews of books or films. I imagine you can recommend a book, music, film, or game that has moved you and deepened your understanding of the world. What recommendation do you have for us that we can share with others who listen to our show? What recommendation do you have for us and why? Leave a voice memo with your name and the town where you live. The number to call is 317 Quakers. That's 317-782-5377. 317 Quakers. Plus one if you're calling from outside the USA. You can also send us an email. I have these contact details in our show notes over at quakerstoday.org.